Hello there, I'm astronaut Ron Evans. On December 6, 1972, I was command module pilot of Apollo 17, the last space flight to the moon. During this flight, I logged 301 hours and 51 minutes in space, one hour and six minutes of which were EVA outside the spacecraft. Please join me now for a vicarious flight to the moon. It's, it's great to be here uh, because it gives me a chance to relive an experience which is kind of beyond, beyond explanation. But I'll tell you what, tonight we're going to do it. We're going to take that flight to the moon, and it's going to be great. But you know what the biggest difference now between what it's like up there in space or out there in space is what we call this zero G, this weightless condition. Uh, be, and, and the biggest difference up there, and it's very, very hard to explain, but you can all visualize that when you're in zero G, you just kind of float around inside the spacecraft, you know, and you'll go over and you'll touch one wall of the spacecraft, and you'll bounce off of that wall, and you'll come on up and you'll touch the ceiling, and you'll bounce off of the ceiling. And if you ever want to turn a somersault, all you have to do is just kind of arch your back a little bit, bend your knees, push off your toes, and you just go round, round, <laughs> round. And it's absolutely a delightful feeling. And if any of you ever get a chance to go into space now, take that chance and go. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> However, in order to get there, there's a little bit of a procedure you must go through. Now, we won't go back through all of the training, the six years and the hard work and all of that kind of stuff. We're just going to start the day of the launch. Now, you get ready to go on that particular day. They take you in and you have a last breakfast <laughs> you know, steak and eggs, <laughs> no matter what time of the day you get going. So you finish eating, and then uh, you go down to a suit room, what we call uh, the suit up room, and then you get into your space suit. And as you get into the space suit, you know, you want to check it out and make sure it's going to work so they pump it up and, you know, and you start being a beetle uh, in, in, inside the space suit to check it, make sure it's going to hold pressure. And then everything gets out, checked out all right, and then they plug in a little uh, carrier that supplies the oxygen and you walk down and go on into a car and then you drive about 10 miles and then you go on up to the bottom of this rocket. You look up in the air. That's the beginning of the old heart starts pity patting just a little bit, you know? <laughs> but then you get in the elevator and you go all the way up to the top of this uh, big old rocket and it's as tall as a 36 story building. Still not on the rocket. And then you have to walk from this uh, gantry uh, type of thing to go on out, uh, the gantry, uh, uh, the thing that holds the rocket up out there, you know. And, and, and then you walk on this thing, it's just a little bitty arm, and then you go on out and you get inside of the spacecraft, and then they do a few checkouts and a few things like that, and then they close the hatch, and then you have a chance to kind of sit there and start thinking. Here I am on top of the rocket that's as tall as a 36 story building. And down inside that rocket, there is four and a half million pounds of liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, and kerosene. <laughs> Are you scared? <laughs> I'll tell you what, if your heart doesn't go pity pat, pity pat, just a little bit faster than normal, you don't understand the potential problem. <laughs> But you get over that, you know, and then they continue down through the countdown, and then it gets down to 10 seconds prior to liftoff, and that's when they ignite those big seven and a half million pounds of thrust engines, and then the in, in rocket starts to shake and vibrate, but it can't get off of the ground, you know, it's still held down onto, onto, onto the launch pad, and then it gets down to T zero, these hold down arms release, and then the old rocket starts going up in the air and accelerating, and, and you're on top of that, and it's shaking, shaking and vibrating and banging away, you know, and then you're going faster and faster and faster and as it accelerates and there's it still shaking and then it starts pushing you back into the seat until two minutes and ten seconds into the flight you've got four and a half G's or four and a half times your own weight pushing you back down into the seat and it's shaking on bang 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 and then bang the engine quits <laughs> you're out of gas <laughs> you know, you're out of gas on the first stage of the rocket you know and you're only 25 miles above the earth you know, and, and you had all of that force pushing you back down in the seat, and that instantaneous deceleration, and then the old rocket goes, yoing, 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 and it vibrates up and down in the longitudinal direction, and then the first stage drops off, and then 
The second stage ignites, and again, you have five big rocket engines on there, but you're above most of the Earth's atmosphere, and all the vibration and shaking stops. And it's a nice, smooth ride. You know, just like driving down a highway in a fancy new Cadillac or Lincoln, you know, whatever fancy new car you've got. Nice, smooth ride, but you're still accelerating. You're climbing higher and higher and higher. And as you accelerate, it starts pushing you back into your seat again. And it carries you on up to 90 miles above the Earth, shuts down again. And you're out of gas on the second stage of the rocket, which is not too bad, except you don't have enough speed now to go all the way around the Earth. So what would happen if you don't get any more speed is the rocket, the astronauts, and the spacecraft go bloop, drop in the water. Not too good, see? We don't want that to happen. So we light off the third stage of this rocket, and then we're 90 miles above the Earth, as I mentioned, you know, and then you start climbing higher, 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 carry it on up to 100 miles above the Earth, let it run out and go a little faster and a little faster and a little faster, shut it down again. And then the first thing you want to know is how fast you're going. So you say, hey, computer, ch -ch 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 -ch, how fast are we going? And the computer reads back and says, you are traveling 17,500 miles an hour. You're really whipping around the earth, I'll tell you. <laughs> Man, I went. You know, it only takes you an hour and a half now to go all the way around the earth. <laughs> and, and then uh, we're in Earth orbit, though. So now we're going to check out our spacecraft. We're only, gonna, we're only going to go around the earth twice. And then we're going to head on out to the moon. But while we're in that three hours going around the earth, and one of the first things we want to do is um, kind of get rid of some of the gloves and the helmet and can't we don't have time to take off the spacesuits, but you get ready to do that. And the first thing you check now is the pressure inside the spacecraft. You want to make sure that it's stopped at five pounds per square inch and held pressure in there. So you check the gauges out pretty good and then it looks all right. So then your gloves are locked onto your suit now with a kind of a lock ring. So you squeeze the lock rings, pop your wrist open a little bit, and then you start breathing. <laughs> Yeah, still breathe. It's okay. Yeah. So you so you take off your glove, you know, and set it out in front of you, and it just kind of floats around out there, you know. And then you reach over and undo the other lock ring, pop it, take that glove off, set it out here, and it just floats around next to the other one. And then you want to get rid of this big old bubble helmet that's on top of your head. And again, it has lock rings on it. So you squeeze the lock rings, undo your helmet, turn it upside down, reach over and grab your glove, stick it in the helmet, reach over and grab the other glove, stick it in the helmet, you know. And then give it a little bit of shove, it goes over in the corner, clink, 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 kind of bounces around the corner. And then comes your first real test of zero G. See, up until this time, we've been strapped into the, the spacecraft, so we're just, you know, riding along there, and we don't even know what it really feels like. So now comes a chance. You reach down, and you undo your lap belt. And you know when, it, when you do that on an airplane here on the Earth, your lap belt goes plunk, you know, and it flops down to the floor. Not so in zero G. You know, the lap belt floats up in the air, the buckle, you know, goes floats right up in the air, and you float right off the seat with it, you know? And, and then you kind of arch your back a little bit and go down in the lower equipment bay, check out all of the equipment, and, and, and uh, really get your first chance to you know, this, do this floating around up there. And it's absolutely delightful. But anyhow, our job now, as I mentioned, is not to go around the Earth. Our job is to go on out to the moon. So we figure out, and we're going to increase our speed, see, and, and, and light the engine and, and leave the Earth. But you figure out n not where the moon is now, but where the moon is going to be out there in space three days later. So you light the engine off, and then uh, as you're sitting in the seat, just kind of floating in the seat, the engine ignites, and the spacecraft comes up, boom, you know, hits you in the behind, and, and, and then you start accelerating, you go faster and faster and faster and faster, and, and, and then it goes, burns for six minutes and 22 seconds, shuts down, then you want to know how fast you're leaving. So you, again, you, hey computer, how fast are we going? The computer reads back, you are traveling 25,000 miles an hour away from the Earth. The computer didn't say that, I did, but anyway, we're leaving the Earth. <laughs> Man, I'm, and we're leaving the Earth. So then, you really have to ask yourself though, how fast is 25,000 miles an hour? You know, the only way that you can tell how fast you're going is with respect to another body or another object. The only object we had up there was the Earth. See? So you look out the window now when you're 100 miles above the Earth, and you can kind of see a slight curvature of it, and you can say, well, maybe it's round, but you really can't tell. But when you're leaving that Earth at 25,000 miles an hour within just 20 minutes, 
that relatively flat earth transitions down to a little ball that you can see out through an eight inch window. Man, oh man, what a sight that is. Now we're heading on out toward the moon. As a matter of fact, we're heading exactly toward the moon, the middle of it. The rocket, the third stage of the rocket, the spacecraft, the lunar module, and the astronauts. See, we're all heading out that way. So what we're gonna do now is make a little mid-course correction because the rocket is gonna continue on out there and hit the moon. So I'm sitting, we're sitting on the top of the rocket here and then we're heading out toward the moon. And then I punch a little button and then the command module separates from the top of the rocket and then I, and I give it a little thrust and I go out away from it and then we turn it around 180 degrees, come back in and dock with the top of the lunar module, which is still in the upper part of the uh, third stage. So we dock and I have another little switch in there and I throw the switch and that separates some explosive bolts and then we back out of the top of the rocket, give it a little thrust backwards and then we just flow it out away, or back out away from the rocket and then after we get out a little ways and then we make a mid-course correction so that we're gonna go around the side of the moon and the rocket goes ahead and hits the moon, see? So we're gonna make a slight correction and now we've got a chance to kind of relax for the next three days as we get ready to go out on, out on out and explore the moon. Now, there's a lot of differences now between what it's like up there in space and what it's like down here on the Earth. And one of the biggest differences, uh, we left it off in the middle of the night, and so we had a relatively short day and it came time to get ready to go to bed again. And as soon as you get ready to sleep up there in zero G, you kind of look around, you know, and, and uh, you think to yourself, now let's see, do I float on my right side? Do I float on my left side? Do I float on my back? I think what it really amounts to is, where's my huggy pillow, you know? <laughs> While you're up there. Now, as a kind of a crutch, uh, we had some vertical supports inside there, so you'd wrap your arm around one of those vertical supports, clamp your fingers together, and just lean your head up against the uh, couch strut, you know, and just kind of go to sleep that way. But after a while, I said, hey, wait a minute. I'm really up here as an astronaut, let's really do it. So all you have to do when you get ready to go to sleep, you just kind of fold your arms a little bit, your knees will bend naturally, close your eyes, mm, go to sleep. However, now, just like down here on the Earth, same thing up in zero G. You kind of toss and turn while you're sleeping up there, see? And every time, you don't wake up, but every time you toss and turn, you bump into something. And you'll bounce off in one direction or another crazy direction. You know, in the, warm, in the morning when you wake up now, your feet will be up in the tunnel maybe, or your head will be back down underneath the couches, or perish the thought you might even be snuggled up next to those other guys you're flying with. Right? <laughs> now, something else is a little different too. When you get up the next morning, uh, down here on the earth, no matter how big a person you think you are, everybody puts their pants on one leg at a time, right? Not so in zero G. <laughs> See, you get up in the morning, just hold your pants out in front of you, you kind of push off with both feet at the same time, and they go, you know, and, and pull your pants on, you know? <laughs> man, oh man. <clears throat> you know, something else now uh, that's a little bit different up there is eating in space. Uh, as you all, I'm sure, recall and know, the food is packaged in kind of a little plastic bag and it's all a freeze-dried type of food. So somehow you have to get water inside that bag to mix with the food. So NASA designed a little uh, kind of a nipple on the one corner of the bag. And then they space qualify it, so they encase it in a kind of a triangular piece of plastic. So in order to get in there, the first thing you've got to do, you want to undo that plastic and then take your water gun and put it in there. So you reach in your back pocket, you get your scissors and you, you cut around that little nipple. And the first time I did that, what happened was I had a little triangular piece of plastic mm, and it was floating all over, you know, creating junk all over the spacecraft. So after what, very quickly, you learn you just cut it around part way around and kind of let it hang there, see? Like that, and then every, all the junk's all hooked up together. So then you reach up and you get your water gun, take your water gun, stick it in this little nipple, go whoink, whoink, whoink. Give it three squirts of water, or four, or whatever to say. It says right on the side of the bag how many you're supposed to get. You know? <laughs> but you still end up with three round spears of water in one end of the bag, and the food is still in the other end of the bag. See? So what you've got to do is take the bag and you smush it around, you know, you shake it, you know, shake it up, and it turns to potato soup or tomato soup or doesn't make a difference what it started out to be. It all ends up soup, you know. Uh, <laughs> but it's still inside the bag. 
<laughs> so then you've got to kind of hold the bag sideways, reach in your back pocket again, get your scissors out, and you, you cut open the top of the bag. And then you've got a bowl of soup sitting there. And you get in your back pocket again, get your spoon, just a plain old uh, soup spoon, very carefully dip it down into your bowl of soup, get a little bit of soup on the spoon, and then reach up and mm, take a bite that way. After a while, I said, hey, wait a minute. I'm in zero gravity now. And there isn't any up, and there isn't any down either, see? So it's the greatest delight while you're having your soup. You can turn your bowl upside down. <laughs> it won't come out. Stick your spoon in the bottom of it, you know? And just kind of float it around, get a little bit of soup on your spoon, you know? And just float around, take a bite that way. <laughs> a lot of fun. It takes a long time to eat up there, but it's a lot of fun, too. Uh, <laughs> I have... Uh, reached the statute of limitations on a secret that we've had throughout all of the space program. That secret is, how do you go to the bathroom in zero gravity? <laughs> Tonight I can let you know. <laughs> now, as you all know, there are two ways, right? <laughs> <laughs> Now, that's right. Now, <laughs> now the first way, <laughs> number one, <laughs> is through a hollow tube that has a little rubber thing on one end of the tube, and the other end of the tube is vented out through a hole in the spacecraft to the vacuum of space. Now, since it's a vacuum out there, and there's a higher pressure on this end, <laughs> It creates a suction on the tube. <laughs> and <laughs> I think you're way ahead of me here. <laughs> now, due to the suction, it must be done very, very carefully, I'll tell you. <laughs> now, the second way is with a, a plastic bag that's about uh, eight inches in diameter and maybe six or eight inches long. And it's open around one end of the bag. And on the outside of that eight inch circular opening is a flap. And on the flap is some stickum. <laughs> you, <laughs> you all, I am sure, can guess where you put that stickum. <laughs> now, now, you've heard of the saying that if you can design a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. Ladies and gentlemen, we need a better mousetrap for that operation, I'll tell you. <laughs> you know, as I mentioned, you leave the Earth at 25,000 miles an hour, and then you can kind of think of it, uh, it's really orbital mechanics, but you can kind of think of the Earth's gravity as slowing you down, slowing you down, slowing you down, until you reach a point between the Earth and the Moon where you're only whipping along at 3,000 miles an hour. And then you come into that lunar gravity, lunar uh, uh, field of influence, and then you start accelerating and accelerating and going faster and faster and faster until by the time you get to the Moon or go along the side of the Moon, you're going too fast to go into an orbit around the Moon. So what you've got to do is turn your spacecraft around backwards, light the engine, slow it down just the right amount of speed so that you can go into an orbit. It's a very, very critical maneuver, as, as many of them are, as all of them are, as a matter of fact. But anyhow, on this particular case, you go by the side of the moon, and you light the engine off, and, and if the engine burns too long, that means you slow down too much, you go by, along the side of the moon, and it goes, boop, hits the back side of the moon. Not too good for the astronauts, see? Or, if you're going along the side of the moon, the engine fires, but it doesn't fire long enough, then it slows you down a little bit, but not enough, and you go, swing, oh, skipping off into space. A little bit of curve, but you're going that way, and the Earth's back over here. Not too good again. So you burn the engine exactly right, and you end up going to, into an orbit around the moon. And the orbit that we ended up in was one that went 60 miles high at the high point, and then I was going to dump these other guys off, see, so we took them down to 50,000 feet. Now, as you're going around the moon, and you start out at 60 miles above the moon, and you look out the window, and you're gonna go zzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
swing, whipping by on the thing. You're looking at it, and then you get on the other side, and then you start climbing back up to 60 miles again, see? So while we're in that orbit, Gene Cernan and Jack Smith uh, jumped in the lunar module, and they separated. They went down and picked up rocks, or whatever they do on the moon, you know. Uh, <laughs> and and, and uh, uh, I lit the engine on my spacecraft and went back up into a circular orbit that was 60 miles high all the way around as you're going around. And that's okay, except they left me all by myself <laughs> for three and a half days. Let me take you with me on just one of those orbits as we go around. Now visualize yourselves. We're gonna start this orbit on the back side of the moon. That's the side you can't see, but we're in the sunshine. Sun is shining back there. And you might say, how's the sun shining on the back side? Uh, now visualize if you have, we'll say, you look, from here you look up the moon and you see a quarter moon, that means that three quarters of the backside is in the sunshine. So we're in that sunshine, see? And then as we continue around the backside of the moon, pretty soon, there's an earth rise. The earth comes up above the horizon, you know? And, and the round part of that crescent earth comes up above the horizon of the moon. And when that happens, we have line of sight communications with everybody down here on the earth. So I finally get a chance to talk to the people in Mission Control and say, hey, I did this and this and this and this. And they, they come back and say, well, you should have done this and this and this. <laughs> but anyhow, anyhow, we can talk to them, see? We, we, and, and I can talk to them, and, and uh, it's great. And then you continue on around the front side of the moon, and then pretty soon, we pass out of that little crescent piece of the moon. That means the sun sets, right? So the sun disappears behind the moon. And then the only light you have up there is earth shine, earth light. See, the sun is shining on the earth, reflecting back up at the moon, and that earth shine was about four times as bright as the brightest moonlit night here on the earth. So I can look down at the moon, I can see the outlines of the craters and the valleys and, and uh, this type of thing. And then we will continue on around the front side of the moon now. And one hour after the Earth came up, the Earth sets. And when the Earth sets, again, the round part of that crescent Earth drops below the horizon of the moon and leaves these little two points of the crescent and they go blink, blink. They disappear. The sun isn't shining. There's no Earth light. You have no communication with anyone on this Earth. And you are in the blackest black you could ever imagine. And yet over the radio, you hear this noise. And it goes, I never did find out what that was either. <laughs> Oh, boy. Well, anyhow, we uh, uh, continue on around there. And uh, after three and a half days, uh, we got ready to re-rendezvous uh, with these guys who had been down uh, on the moon. And of course, I was, as I mentioned, all by myself. So they get in the top half of their, their lunar module, and they use the bottom half as a kind of a launch platform. Light, they light the engine, and then this funny-looking crazy thing uh, lifts off of the moon and they chase me around uh, for about four hours or so, and then f we finally get caught up together, and I look out, and, and here is this funny-looking thing, you know, they got the little triangular windows that uh, look like eyes sticking out there, and then they, there's a hatch down in the front of it that looks kind of, you know, kind of like a mouth, and, and uh, we get up close together, and then they, uh, we get ready, and they flip it over, and then I go ahead and, and thrust on in with my uh, thrusters, and we come on in, we got docked together, and Shortly after we got docked with this crazy looking vehicle or whatever it was, I heard. <laughs> and I said, Who's there? <laughs> uh, they convinced me who it was. And uh, <laughs> so I opened the hatch. I opened the hatch. And, and when I opened the hatch, you know, those guys had been down there walling around in that very, very fine lunar dust. And, and when they opened the hatch, this dust just kind of flowed or filtered, infiltrated my nice, clean spacecraft. You know, all these rocks and everything else came across there. And man, were they dirty. But uh, <laughs> we, we got all, all squared away. And uh, we stayed around the moon then for uh, another day doing geological uh, observations and uh, a few other things. 
And then it comes time to uh, head back home. In order to get back, you have to increase your speed to escape the lunar gravity as you're going around there. So you light the engine on the back side of the moon. And again, it has to burn exactly the right amount so you can come on out and head back toward the Earth. And you know, here we are 250,000 miles away from the Earth. And, and the Earth looks like a little ball up there, uh, slightly larger than the moon does from down here. But uh, you'd think, you know, you'd aim right for the middle of it, you know, make sure you're going to hit it to coming back. But you really don't do that. What you do, you kind of visualize this round ball, and you have to come in exactly six degrees down from what we call the, the tangent or the local horizontal at that particular point where you're going to hit the Earth's atmosphere at 300,000 feet above the Earth. Now, if you come in, we'll say, seven degrees down, that means you're coming in too steep. You're, you're still skimming along now. You're speeded up at 25,000 miles an hour again. You're going to hit the friction of that Earth's atmosphere. And the rate of that heating up of the spacecraft is too much, and it tends to burn the spacecraft up. So you don't want to do that. Or if you come in now, instead of six degrees, you come in down just five degrees down. That means you're going to come on in. You're going to hit the Earth's atmosphere. It's going to slow you down a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, but not enough to capture you. And it goes swing off into space. Maybe to come back, maybe not. But anyway. So you come in exactly six degrees down, and, and, and you come in six degrees down, and then when you get down to 300,000 feet above the Earth, that's when you start feeling the friction of the atmosphere, and I have a little G-meter inside the spacecraft, and it reads 0 0.05 Gs, 5 hundredths of a G. And that's the signal, hey, Gene, Jack, hang on, something's going to happen. And does it ever, very, very rapidly, from 5 hundredths of a G in just 35 seconds time, you've got seven Gs pushing you back down into the seat on the spacecraft, you know, it starts pushing you back down in there, and then the spacecraft, uh, due to this aerodynamic friction and whatever, it starts to skip back out into space. So before it goes from seven Gs back up to four Gs, you've got to turn it upside down, make it dig back into the Earth's atmosphere, so it'll come on down, come on down, come on down, and then you have four Gs, and then down to three Gs, and then down to two Gs, and then one G, and then it starts to tumble and flop around, and then you get down to 25,000 feet, and boom, the dog parachutes come out. Got us going in the right direction. No, we're coming down back in first. <laughs> you know? So we're going in the right direction. We get down to 10,000 feet, and then boom! Three big mortars fire, and, and three uh, supposed to be parachutes come out through these uh, mortars out through the top of the spacecraft. And, and when that happens, you look up, and there's nothing but strings. You know, look up, and, and there's still nothing but strings. And you look up again, and there's nothing but strings up there. You know, and then pretty soon you say, unfold, unfold, you better, you know, do something. You know? And then pretty soon, ah, here it comes. So we've got three parachutes, you know, and, and everything looks good. The only thing we've got left to do now is to hit the water. So as we, I had an altimeter in the spacecraft, and as you get close to the water, I started calling off uh, the altitudes. And then we got down to 500 feet, 400 feet, 300 feet, boom, we hit the water. Altimeter was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, we, we weren't prepared. Uh, <laughs> you know, that was a very uh, uh, quick 13-day uh, flight to the moon. I'd like to share another experience try to help you visualize uh, something that you can see up there. And that is, I mentioned this Earth, and it's a beautiful Earth. It, it's, we started out and it was a round, full round ball, and then it, when we were coming back in, it was just a little bit of crescent. But in that 13 days of, of going out and around the moon and watching the Earth, uh, Earth rise, Earth set, and then watch it uh, rotate in that infinity of space up there with respect to the stars, it moves with respect to the stars. It also rotates on its own axis, and you, wa you can watch day turn into night, and you can see the blues and the tans and the reds of the comet. And yet, there aren't any strings holding that up. I'll tell you what now. You cannot have participated in such an adventure without reinforcing your belief in whatever belief you had before you left. Really. Now, we had left the moon, and then the next day, uh, I had the opportunity to go outside the spacecraft to retrieve some film cassettes that were out there. And here we are, here we are 180,000 miles from the Earth. We're moving along at 10,000 miles an hour. And then we've got to put on those dirty old spacesuits, 
uh, and get ready to go outside. You, you know, you, in those days, you'd open the hatch and, you know, everybody's out in the vacuum. So everybody's got to put on their spacesuits, uh, dirty old things, and get the zippers all lined up again. And then you have a test in there, and you turn a little valve, and, and it pumps you up again and makes you like a beetle uh, inside the spacesuit as it overpressurizes it to check out the pressure. And then everything looks good, so then you let the pressure back down again, and then you get ready to open and really go outside this time. And behind my head over here is a, is a valve, and you open that valve and just barely crack the valve and go, <laughs> sucks all the air uh, out of the spacecraft, and the little space suits, they pop up, you know, blow up again. And, and, and then the, you still have the hatch there, so you check out everything for a little while, and then you reach over and you, <laughs> and the hatch <laughs> blows open. Now comes the time. You're going outside, and I'll tell you, if you ever want to be a spaceman, that's the time. When you're out there in that vacuum of space, and the only thing between you and that, and that vacuum is, if you, is your spacesuit, and you can maneuver in those days just by hanging on to the side of the spacecraft and going hand over hand, never letting go of both hands at the same time, I'll tell you. <laughs> you know, but at least you were maneuvering around there, and you go down and pick up the film cassettes and, and come back in, and I did that three times. And then the third time, uh, you finally have a time to kind of relax a little bit. Hey, our mission is pretty well completed. I've got the third cassette uh, rash, uh, attached to my arm, and we're coming back in. And, and uh, I kind of relax a little bit, and you kind of look around. You know, what, is, what does it look like up there? What can you see? And, and, and off over to my left, there was a moon. And it was a full moon. Looked about the same size as it does from down here. And then over to my right, since we were between the Earth and the moon, was a crescent Earth. And, and the height of that crescent was four times as, height, as high as the diameter of the moon. And then 30 degrees or so off in that black infinity of space was a disk, an emphasized disk of a sun. You can't tell the sun is shining unless it reflects off of or hits a body up there. You know, it hits the moon or that crescent piece of the Earth or in that one little area down on my spacecraft where I was you know, going hand over hand back and forth down there. And when I was coming back in the, uh, the third time, as I mentioned, I finally looked down, and would you believe, right there where that sun was shining on the spacecraft, painted down there below the hatch, was an American flag. And below that flag, it said, again painted in there, United States of America. I could not help pause and reflect for a moment that your nation, my nation, through our endeavors and accomplishments in space during that period of time, created an unprecedented prestige in the eyes of the rest of the world. You know, I'm proud to be a part of that program, but I am even more proud to be an American. Thank you all. Good.